Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to mumble! Introducing first in the black corner in his trademark office suit jacket tie. With a record of over 8,000 tax returns and 1,000 vast statements lodged, standing 5'11 and weighing in at... <coughs> he is the man with the tax plan, the sultan of spreadsheets, the baron of vast statements, the king of ka -ching. Hailing from Ballarat, Victoria, Peter Angel! And in the white corner, sporting his struggling artist casuals, with a record of one and a half feature length films, one web series, and numerous award winning shorts, standing 5'10 and weighing in at the Kubrick of Claptrap, the Mac Daddy of the MacGuffin, the Caesar of Subtext, the champion of all things indie, the arrogant know it all Israeli bastard, now hailing from Melbourne, Victoria, the unpronounceable. How do you say this? Itai Gumaman! Sit back and enjoy as they trade opinion jabs, fighting for their favourites and battling politely through the best and worst of, well, anything they see fit really. The accountant versus the filmmaker, the financial consultant versus the artist. What can possibly go wrong? Tune in and find out on the Best and Worst podcast, where it ain't all black and white. Welcome to the Best and Worst podcast. Today we'll be talking about uh, Quentin Tarantino films. We'll be trying to put them in some sort of an order from 1 to 10 or 10 to 1. Uh, my name's Peter Angel and I'm talking to Itai Guberman. Hello, hello. And, hello, uh, how's it going? Oh, going good, going well. Um, not one thing we need to mention is um, we are looking at the 10 films that Tarantino directed, uh, not counting ones he wrote or directed segments in. So From Dust Till Dawn is out, Natural Bone Killers, True Romance, and Four Rooms out the window. And My Best Friend's Birthday, which he made over three years, but was a, a filmmaking project, I guess, which uh, is good for us because that rounds it out to 10. Easy peasy. So, yeah, the I guess we can sort of approach it as the top, the top few are the best and the last few are the worst. Um, but yeah, with Tarantino, even the worst is not so bad. So That's true. I, I, I have this love-hate relationship with um, Quentin Tarantino. Some of his films are very, very good and some of his films, eh. But even his eh <laughs> films are still, yeah, you, you have to admit that they are still very good films. Yeah, at the very least entertaining, even, even when... He kind of pisses me off because I'm I'm disappointed and I think he could have done better. I still end up admitting that it's actually, you know, still an above average film. So very tough to complain. But yeah, he's um he's probably one of my favorite however many directors because he's made quite a few films that are considered to be Excellent, especially the top three on the list. So yeah, yes, yes, and um, yeah, we'll we'll get to each of our favourite and least favourite a bit later. But being a numbers guy, I sort of wanted to go through the top ten uh, according to IMDb. I know IMDb isn't the be all and end all, and it doesn't make a good film just because it's rated highly on IMDb. But it might give us some sort of point of reference. It's a democracy, and people voted, so we have to kind of use it as some kind of point of comparison, but it doesn't necessarily no, mean much. No, that's right. So just just like just like a real democracy. Exactly right. And we all know how well democracy works in in a lot of places around the world at the moment. But anyway. So coming in at number ten is Death Proof. Uh IMDB rating of seven point zero. Then after that we've got Jackie Brown, uh seven point five. But that kind of proves the point of what we were saying before. You know, even on IMDb, his worst film is a seven. Uh, exactly right. I was looking at some Adam Sandler films today, and that his best was about a seven, and they went down to about one and a half. So people can be pretty brutal on IMDb. But yes, so at number nine is Jackie Brown. Uh, number eight, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, 7.7, .7, which again is pretty good, mm -hmm. but a bit surprised it's that low. But again, we'll get to that a bit later. Number six. Hateful Eight, that had a scoring of 7.8. And then we've, we've got Kill Bill 2 and then Kill Bill 1 at 8 and 8.1. Then we move up to his fourth best, according to IMDb, is Inglorious Bastards. Third best, Reservoir Dogs. 
second best Django Unchained. Now we're up to 8.4 on IMDb, which is very high. And the number one film, according to IMDb, is Pulp Fiction with a score of 8.9, which, considering it was 26 years ago, that's, that's held up very well. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So Django's number two, you said? Django number two at 8.4. Wow. I'm assuming one of those 8.4s <laughs> wasn't yours. <laughs> Probably not. I also had a look at the budgets for each of the films and how much they took in at the box office. Now, I won't necessarily go through the whole lot, but Reservoir Dogs, which I consider to be a very good film, only had a return on investment of 238%. So its budget was $1.2 million, only brought in $2.8 million at the box office. Yeah, but it's kind of fair enough. You know, it was his first film. Nobody really knew who he was at the time, and he didn't really get a major release. So, yeah. And again, we're not looking into, well, VHS probably at that time, DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, merchandise, and all the rest of it. So Reservoir Dogs could have ended up higher on the real list, but this is just the information that's available online and uh, a bit of an indication of maybe something. Exactly right. And, yeah, that was the, I guess, second worst, Death Proof. It cost $30 million and only brought in $56.5 million at the box office. So. Of his later films, Death Proof, the worst box office. Yeah, also interesting because that was part of uh, of what was supposed to be the uh, the Grindhouse series, along with Planet Terror, Robert Rodriguez. So that's actually interesting. Yeah, I, I wonder because they ended up splitting them sort of almost completely as two two different films, um, even though on some some places they still um, screen together. But yeah, still surprising, especially because. Tarantino was kind of probably around the the sort of peak of his popularity around that time. So yeah, so that was a bit of a, a bit of a drop off for him. People didn't enjoy it as much. Um, going to the second highest for return on investment, Jackie Brown cost about twelve million to make and brought in nearly seventy five million at the box office. Mm, twelve million, surprising. That's uh, that's kind of a lower budget than I would have uh, expected, probably with all the big names in it. And y- you think De Niro would have wanted ten million of that, wouldn't you? <laughs> at least. <laughs> But that's the thing. A lot of people would have taken a pay cut to, uh, to be in a Tarantino true, film. So. True. And then number one, uh, Pulp Fiction, cost $8 million to make, $214 million at the box oh. office, 2,677% return on investment. Not bad. Not surprised. Impressed, but not surprised. And again, a, a film that has, um, you know, Travolta, Keitel, Bruce Willis, Uma Thurman, you know, it, it should have cost more than $8 million realistically. But people took a pay cut to be in a Tarantino film. True. And when you consider it was back in 1994, to get $214 million at the box office, that's it's un- unbelievable, really, because you add on top of that the merch, the CD sales, all of that sort of stuff. Mm, yeah. Well, the soundtrack, the DVD, the Blu-ray, yeah, that, that one sold a lot. Hugely profitable film. Yeah. And deservedly so. True. I think it was it was uh, nominated for an Academy Award. I think a few of his were, but Pop Fiction, I guess some people would have considered that it was a bit unlucky not to win the Academy Award. Unlucky is an interesting choice of words. Well, yeah. Forrest Gump won that year. I think um, anything could have won against Forrest Gump. Yeah, yeah. I think Forrest Gump is, yeah, not, not in, in that league. You know, entertaining, but... Best film at the Oscars. Yeah, and then Shawshank Redemption was also in that year. So yeah, that one I could have, I could have probably stomached. Yeah, you know? yeah, but Forrest Gump. It's uh, anyway. That's a, that's a different different subject, different day. Mm-hmm. But would have would have been a strong year at the Oscars, no question. Now we're going to uh, talk about what you and I thought, Ty. As far as I guess, we'll start from the least po- our least popular to most popular. My least popular for me it kind of stands out. I think it's the one film. That really made me angry because it's Kill Bill 2 and being a sort of a sequel or a second part of a film that I actually really liked, I felt that it kind of took away something from the first one when I felt Tarantino kind of ruined the character a little bit in the second one. So yeah, it's it's by far, I'd say, my least favorite. And yeah, so least favorite meaning disappoint, disappointed, I guess. Like again, all, all the films he made were well well done. It's just that I, I agree with you. Uh, for me, it was my least favourite as well. I have this pet peeve that anybody that makes a volume one or a volume two of the same film, they cut it in half and they try to sell it to you twice. It, it just annoys me. But also uh, martial arts films, I'm you know, not big on martial arts films. For, for me, I'm, I'm glad that he split them in half because if this story would have been tacked on to the first one, it would have ruined it. Because it it broke off the consistency of of the main character. She was a a well-oiled machine in the first one that turned into a 
I don't know, like an inexperienced assassin all of a sudden who does really stupid things, and it didn't make sense to me. And also, there's a scene towards the end, what is known as the Superman monologue by um, David Carradine. And to me, that scene, that, that monologue, as great as it is, always felt like it was tacked onto the film, like he stuck it in there because he wanted to and not because it had anything to do with anything. It just felt very forced. And yeah, a lot about that film felt forced to me and kind of manufactured. Like it, it didn't happen organically. Whereas the first one I thought was much better. Um, but yeah, that one we kind of disagree on, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Kill Bill 2 came out in 2004, a year later. Do you think having to wait a year to see the second part of Kill Bill when you enjoyed the first one so much, do you think that ruined it for you? I actually didn't mind that at all. A year is not terribly long uh, between films, and I, I always looked at it more as a sequel than a second part of a, of a sort of a split film, because I always always thought there was a third coming as well, and it hasn't yet, although they're still talking about it. But, but yeah, I, I expected Kill Bill 2 to be at least as good as 1 or close to, and it was just nowhere near. So. Yeah, so I look, I agree with you. As I said, Kill Bill 2 was my 10th favourite or my least favourite. Kill Bill 1 was my ninth favourite or my second least favourite, mainly to do with the martial arts films. I get bored watching them. I can, you know, appreciate the choreography. I can appreciate that it's difficult to do, but it just, I can't get into the film. I just get a little bit bored. So for me, it was my ninth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I am less a martial arts hater. I actually am a bit of a martial arts fan. I used to watch a lot of uh, Bruce Lee films when I was younger and uh, Sonny Chiba. And yeah, it, it's to me, martial arts became less of a thing as time went by because as I grew older and understood more and more about movies, a lot of the martial arts film got more and more, well, B grade and lower. So to me, actually watching something like Kill Bill seeing a martial arts film in a sort of an A-grade film, I thought, was actually a good thing. So it's not, it's not my ninth. <laughs> let's put it that way. My ninth is actually Hateful Eight. Again, th for, from here on, they're all films that I actually liked. So even though it's sitting amongst my, my worst, it wasn't that bad. It was uh, quite a bit probably too long than it should have been. Yes, 168 minutes. It's quite a long film for a couple of locations, really, yeah. And, and it, it had something that happens from time to time in Tarantino films where some of the dialogue felt a bit forced to me and it felt like Tarantino was impersonating himself, um, copying himself, you know. Just a lot of it felt like he was like writing old jokes in a way from other films, just in the way they talk and the kind of language that they use. While, you know, in earlier films it was very cool you can't just keep writing that same thing. You gotta, you gotta change the pace a little bit and, and make things a bit more interesting. And I felt he didn't do that with this one. But overall, it was still a great film. I, I thought that Samuel L. Jackson's performance was fantastic. Probably one of his best performances. Yeah, I think so too. Very, very good in it. Yeah, and for, like for that reason, I, I, I couldn't, you know, dislike the film. I just think it's, it's lower. And it's just, again, amazing cast, you know, with Kurt Russell and Jennifer Jason Lee and uh, Tim Roth, Walton Goggins. Michael Madsen, probably don't even have to mention, he's in almost every one of his films. Well, so uh, well in this one, I think it's James Parks. I don't know if Michael Parks is in it. No, I don't think so. Well, Zoe Bell True. is in it as yep. well. You know, kind of a surprising role, but still, yeah, a, a, there's a lot of cool when it comes to Tarantino. And I think he uses actors yep. in that way. Yep. That is just that is just so cool. Yeah, uh, who was uh, Channing Tatum was in this as well, out of nowhere. So <laughs> that was kind of a kind of a surprise. So yeah, some of it some of it worked. I'd say probably maybe most of it worked, but there there was enough in it that didn't to drop it down the list. Yeah, well for me, I rated that as my uh, sixth favorite, so not as low as you. But that may have been because I only watched it a couple of days ago, so it's still fresh. I did feel that it was. It was almost like a couple of films. It, it seemed to be going one way, and then all of a sudden he rehashed Reservoir Dogs and everybody bled out at the end. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was good, good but very long, very long. Yeah, yeah. You kind of wanted, almost wanted it to end by the end, which is never no, a good thing. No, it's not. Yeah. But, yeah, I, st I still felt 
like you know got something out of it and again so many sort of favorite actors as well that that always keeps you in it you know it's it's probably a solid you know seven and a half out of ten for me still a very good film just could have been much better possibly if Tarantino's ego didn't play into it I think. yes yeah I, I sometimes wonder what his films would be like if he let somebody else have a crack at the edit mm. even if he came back afterwards you know if he just let somebody knock out 10 or 15 minutes of his favorite stuff that isn't anybody else's favorite stuff yeah I agree his, his films do tend to be long um, sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't or less so yeah well my eighth favorite was death proof yeah, um, same here. I Yep. Oh, we're on the same page. Excellent. Kind of. So again, yeah, a, a good film, but just not one of his best. I wanted to really like it. I liked the idea of the grindhouse. I, I I used to be a very big fan of Robert Rodriguez. Still a fan of Robert Rodriguez. But yeah, this just I don't know. Didn't do it for me. Hmm. Well, it it did it for me. Um, again, you know, I liked H- Hateful Eight, and it's ranked a bit lower. So this one, obviously, I liked. It. There was something about it that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed that sort of grit um, that it had going for it. And um, I, f- I remember laughing out loud because I, I felt that, you know, a lot of what they did in that movie was very, very tongue-in-cheek. It was almost almost a parody of, of Grindhouse, not so much an homage, you know, um, yep. with, with the way even the, he directed the actors the way Kurt Russell acted and the way some of the other ones, it just, it felt like they were putting on a show, which was kind of mimicking, I think. But I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was very funny, very, you know, very entertaining. The action was good. As usual, there's some blood, you know, in Tarantino's films, which was actually of course, pretty good. It's fine. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And as you said, a good cast. It had Rosaria Dawson in, which I hadn't seen in any of his other films. Yeah, she's a, Big favorite of mine. I really, really like watching her. She's she's really good in almost everything, even in crappy films. Yeah, Rose McGowan, of course. I think he had a fling with her, did he? Or was that Rodriguez? All I know is it wasn't me. But she's also in uh, Planet Terror, um, you know, a sort of a bigger role. That's right. She was the, the one that held them together almost. Yeah. Yeah, Zoe Bell, of course, is in this. Eli Roth was in there. And Sydney Poitier, Sydney Poitier's daughter. Yep. May have been the first time I saw her, actually, and I thought she was very good. Yep. So, again, a, a solid film. It's just not one of my favorites. Yeah. A lot of people don't like it. For me, I think it's it's a bit underrated, even, because uh, I think it's almost close to an 8 out of 10. And look, it was only a little over two hours, so you got to love that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's probably because it was part of a two-film thing that was supposed du- to be Double one. feature. Yeah. That didn't turn out necessarily to be a double feature. Hmm. Yeah, and no, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think it's uh, it's a great film. Yep. So then my number seven was Django Unchained. Same here. Oh, oh boy. And we didn't fire. even watch them together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, for me, that's almost surprising to have the two Westerns that he made be on the bottom half. Yeah, because you're a big fan of the Westerns. I don't mind them. But, yeah, you've um, you've got more of a, I guess, a history with them. Hmm. And with Django, that, that was a plus, like a, a positive and a negative. I'm not sure why he even used the whole Django title because it was, to me, it wasn't very similar to the old Django films, the Franco Nero films. Yeah, maybe it was just an excuse to sneak him in there. Yeah, I think it's, again, it's Tarantino's homage and, and kind of trying to let people know that he's seen all these old westerns. He even had Franco Nero um, pop in there for a bit of a cameo. Yep. Which to me was a delight. <laughs> I love that that scene, um, especially jumping up and, and telling everyone who that is and nobody knew who it was, which was both fun and disappointing. But yeah, no, J- Jamie Foxx did really well. Christoph Waltz is always fantastic. This is potentially the best I've seen DiCaprio in, in anything. He was very, very good at being very unlikable. Absolutely. And Kerry Washington and Walton Goggins, James Ramar, I think, had a double role in this. Yeah. It's good to see Don Johnson as well. Yes, absolutely. Big daddy. Uh, yeah. The big disappointment um, for me in this was Samuel L. Jackson, who I love. But I thought in this, Tarantino kind of screwed the pooch. Yeah. He was almost a stereotype, which, you know, you compare it to The Hateful Eight, where he was so good. And, you know, similar type of time frame and, and all the rest of it. It's just he wasn't good in it at all. No. He was way, way over. And that really kind of ruined a lot of scenes for me. And I just could not understand how 
a director as good as Tarantino couldn't see it. So I assume that's exactly what he wanted. Aside for, you know, throwing the N-word around 17 million times. In a too couple. many, too many. And yeah, that's one of my memorable things in this film, which wasn't a good thing that it just got to be too many. Like if it's one, two, three, four times, okay, you know, in the right setting and all the rest of it. But when it was so many times, it just, it took me out of the film. It's just, it felt like he made a bet with somebody to say that he could put 150 or 200 or however many it was in it. It was just ridiculous. I don't mind all of that being in it if it's, you know, necessary and if it fits the story, but it just felt so forced. And again, that and Samuel Jackson's character just felt very, very forced to me and still somehow did not fully ruin the film. You know, it's still a very good film. I really enjoyed it. And again, I think this one had a lot more small parts for for actors we haven't seen in a long time or sort of old favorites, James Russo and uh, Don Stroud, who I used to watch in a lot of old westerns, Bruce Dern, MC Gainey, Jonah Hill. I know, even he popped up, you know. Yeah, Zoe Bell. Yeah, and John Jarrett. I was actually, I'd, I'd heard he was in it, and I was looking forward to him having a large part in a Hollywood film. Blink and you miss him almost. Well, he was in the scene with Quentin Tarantino, which was a terrible scene. I, I watched it and couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, why? But yeah, but it was there. Also, um, Robert Carradine, you know, uh, David Carradine's brother. Um, yep. And yeah, again, James Parks. Tom Savini was in this. Yeah, yeah. So it could have been very good. It's just that it was quite good for me. Yeah, yeah. It could have been, it, it could have been excellent, but it ended up being very good for me. It's like both well done and a missed opportunity. <laughs> um, and yeah, for me, then uh, my number six we've already spoken about was the Hateful Eight. And for you, my number six is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Ooh, yep, yep. So you saw that recently, is that right? I saw that a couple of days ago for the first time, and I really enjoyed it. I just had a tough time putting it over certain films that have been kind of favorites for a long time. I even had a tough time putting it above Django, but in the end I thought, you know what, it's a better film. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. He did a, a similar thing in this one to what he did in uh, Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, you know, spoilers, Tatum. spoilers. Well, I think, <laughs> I think everybody's seen, you know, at least Inglorious yeah, Bastards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if, if you're listening to a, uh, Two Idiots on a podcast, then, <laughs> yeah, you've probably seen it. Well, and, and if you, if you, even if you haven't, doesn't quite ruin it because Tarantino tends to take, well, not in all of his films, but at least in those, in a couple, uh, a historical event and then kind of tweak it. So sometimes it's to give you that sort of feel of the era and then he just does something in it that is completely historically incorrect on purpose. And yeah, he did something kind of interesting in this one, but because I sort of knew his MO, I could see it coming a mile away. So I kind of knew where it was going and I still enjoyed it a hell of a lot. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll look on the same. And again, yeah, I expected it not to be historically correct. So you just have to you just have to go with it. There's there's uh, mass murders that don't happen at the end and the hero saves the day and things like that. But also things like the fight with Bruce Lee, which, well, it's, it's upset people apparently that it was in the film. But the things like that, you, you know they're not historically correct. Yeah, this is probably DiCaprio's second best performance after Django. I think it's, again, I was watching the film and I was like... He looks like a has-been, doesn't he? Yeah, and he's both kind of likable and you also kind of feel sorry for him. And the whole time he was just really believable as, as this character that he was playing. Brad Pitt is just one cool cat. I mean, the guy can act. He, he looked fantastic. And he just made that role cooler than it could have been if somebody else was in it, you know? The, the two of them also, very different characters, but fantastic chemistry, which is great to see. They were playing off each other. Really yeah, well. and you know, as distinct from some of the other films we've spoken about, there probably wasn't a bad performance in it, really. No, not at all. Surprisingly, too, because some people played real characters. This Mike Moe, uh, who I'm not very familiar with, he's the one who played Bruce Lee. While the look wasn't quite right, the you know that sort of impersonation that he did of Bruce Lee was very good. I enjoyed it. I even I was sort of in on the joke. They kind of made Bruce Lee look like an unlikable character. 
a bit, you know, sort of fakey. I'm not sure that has anything to do with, you know, how he really was, but I still enjoyed it. And I, I could sort of, it had a feel of a bit of a joke, which worked. And it's almost as if, aside for the top two characters, the rest are almost all either supporting characters or, or cameos. Even though Margot Robbie has a, an important role in this. Still off to the side, yeah. A little bit, but she was definitely after the top two. Yeah, and, and what do you think of um, Steve McQueen? Well, Steve McQueen is one of my favourite actors. <laughs> and, and in this one, Damien Lewis plays him. And when they first showed him, I was like, oh, damn it, that is such a terrible casting. It just it doesn't work. And then he started talking. <laughs> And every time he made some sort of a facial expression, I was like, oh, my God, that is spot on. And he was really good. He was really good. But by the end of it, like, even though it's just a, such a small part, it was very entertaining for me and sort of made me realize that Damien Lewis has really been impersonating Steve McQueen his whole life. Like all these micro expressions, the, the, the squinting, it's just all very, very Steve McQueen. And I never noticed it before. So, so he's made a great career out of just being an imposter. Yeah, he's kind of like a not as good version or not as charismatic version of Steve McQueen. Let's call him Ginger Steve McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do like Damien Lewis in almost everything I've seen him in. So, yeah. and I think it was Luke Perry's last film too. It was really great, like to see him there. I wish they would have sort of shown him a bit more. Yep. Same with uh, Bruce Dern. He had a very, very small role. Dakota Fanning. You, you blink and you miss her. I like the little girl, Julia. Butters, I think. I'm not sure. She was very good, though, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, very entertaining. And But um, who was it? One who got a bit more of a... St- oh, Timothy Oliphant, I thought was very good. And Maya Hawke as well, Ethan Hawke's daughter. Very good. Oh, we forgot Al Pacino. Hoo-ha! Yeah, who was Mr. Schwarz. Not Schwartz. Schwarz. But yeah, he was... Funnily enough, I don't know if you've seen this, the uh, Amazon series Manhunters, maybe something like, something like that. Yeah, it's almost the same character. He plays it almost exactly the same. And again, I didn't mind it. But also Emil Hirsch, who played Jay Sebring, and, and Lena Dunham. Yes, yes. Small part, but, but, but good. Yeah, that surprised me. Just sort of out of nowhere. I had no idea she was in the film. Yeah, and did we mention Kurt Russell? He had a small part in it too. Yes, he did with Zoe Bell. That was a very entertaining scene. And Scoot McNary had a very small um, role as well. Good old Scoot. He's good. Uh, from um, Halt and Catch Fire is uh, Scoot McNary. And surprisingly, uh, Michael Madsen was in there too. Yes. <laughs> he was He was there with... James Rimmer on the Bounty Law. Yeah. Uh, apparently they're working on perhaps getting that as, into a TV show. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. So. But yeah, huge, yeah, huge cast, really. Like considering, yeah. and something a lot of people may not know is that Tarantino's wife is in the movie. However, briefly, she's Daniela Pick. She plays Daphna Bencobo, who was his co-star when he goes to make a film in Italy or whatever. Aha! Uh-huh. So they kind of mention her, show her, and I was like, ah, I know her. <laughs> she's a an, an Israeli musician sort of thing. But yeah. And Brenda Vaccaro has a small role in Lou Temple. It's just, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of good actors in this. Yeah, and I rated this film higher than you. This was my third favorite out of his films. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I liked it. It was good. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it over time will go up in my list. But for now, I've, I sort of had a bit of a tough time bumping it above certain films. But I still think it's, it's at least like a solid eight, maybe eight and a half out of ten. So it's it's that good. It's just that, yeah, we, we're entering top five territory now and they, they get better and better. That's right. So I kind of gave the benefit of the doubt probably to some of the older films that I've liked for a, a long, long time. Yep. And well, speaking of top five, my number five is Inglorious Bastards. Mine is Jackie Brown. Ooh. But my fourth is Inglorious Bastards. Yep. Well, we'll talk about Jackie Brown if you like. Sure thing. Yeah, Jackie Brown is, for, for a long time, it was in my top three Tarantino films. Um, so I, I actually think it's a very, very good film. It's based on an Elmo Leonard novel. And yeah, I, I have to say, when, when I heard it was coming out, I thought it was very interesting and cool. I just wasn't sure how an Elmo Leonard film would look, you know, sort of, you know, as, as a Tarantino work. But I had a, a hunch that it'll be pretty good. And it didn't disappoint. It had, again, something that Tarantino tends to do with a lot of his films, and and that's sort of bring actors back from the brink. Actors who have been sort of almost forgotten and, you know, don't really get the roles or just do 
big red shitty films are kind of have disappeared into uh, obscurity. So you'd be talking about Pam Greer and um, Robert Forster? And Michael Keaton at the time. Oh, yeah. Well, gee, he's really gone on kick goals since then, hasn't he? He has, and this was his, his big comeback. So I think both he and Travolta, you know, should be kissing Tarantino's feet for... Kissing his ring. Uh, that too. But yeah, now Robert Forster was... Uh, a bit of a favourite of mine when I was younger as well. I, I saw him in a lot of movies. And yeah, Pam Greer in a lot of those black exploitation films. Yep, she was the go-to, wasn't she, for a long time? Yeah, she was very, very cool. And in this one, she was as well. One of my favourite roles of Samuel L. Jackson, so he did very well as Ordell. Yeah, well, he was, I guess it's a role he's played a lot, but he was just, yeah, he was cool. He fit in. It wasn't a stretch by any measure, was it, for him? He just played it very well. It's based on, on an Elmo Leonard um, novel called Rum Punch. And when I read the book, I already could imagine him in that role. It was kind of made for it. Yeah, Michael Keaton really impressed me in this one. He, in, in the past, has been more of a comedic kind of actor. I never thought he was that great. And I think from this film on, I, you know, he's become a real favorite of mine to watch. So, yeah, I think kind of turned a corner there. But this one also had Robert De Niro, Bridget Fonda. Chris Tucker, Tucker, Tucker. Yeah. Sid Haig, the late Sid Haig. Lisa Gay Hamilton, who used to be on The Practice all those years ago. Yeah, she's been in a few things over time. But also um, Tiny Lister, who recently passed away, I think, was in this. Yeah, yeah, no, a, a solid film. I, I always thought it was better than uh, than a lot of film. A lot of people gave it credit for sort of thing. People, I think, were disappointed initially, although it was a big hit. But I think it was going to be a big hit no matter what because everybody was waiting to see the next Tarantino film. Yeah, and again, for the $12 million budget, it's an unbelievable cast, isn't it? Yeah, and, and also a, a very good film for, for such a budget. You know, if you look at it today, you know, when, when every film needs $100 million, it's, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you, you, you kind of, it, it stands the test of time. This, this film has not aged much at all. So, yeah, it's, um, it'll always be one of my, my Tarantino favorites, but, yeah, I had to kind of put it at number five. Yep, and I was, I was close. I put it four. Yeah, 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 and I, I, I flip flopped Inglorious Bastards and Jackie Brown quite a few times before I kind of settled this way. Inglorious Bastards, my number four, um, just had a little bit of oomph to it, I guess that I that I really like, and I don't know, I'm just a sucker for that opening scene. It was just amazing. Very, very good opening, and well, for people that don't like Hitler, probably a very good ending too. Oh yeah. And for those who do, what? <laughs> but yeah, we were talking about how we're not sure in the past. We, we, well, we've talked about Tarantino a lot in the past, but the spelling of Inglorious Bastards was always... A, it it a, frustrates me. For somebody whose mother was a school teacher, I would have never got away with that. Yeah, yeah. And it it has, what, at least uh, two spelling mistakes and one one is like an addition of a letter. So... <laughs> Yeah, very, very strange. I thought originally that it was a typo and that they would fix it, but obviously not. Yeah, no, I, I, I thought that there's some meaning to it, but I never, never found out. I think I read something about it, but there was always like, uh, like rumors unconfirmed. I think they asked him in a in an interview once why, and he said that bastards is just the way it sounds. But I, I half think that's from you know directing Lawrence Tierney in Reservoir Dogs. Bastards, <laughs> those bastards. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, if that's the biggest problem with it, then it's not a bad film, is it? Really? Someone interviewed him on uh, on one of those talk shows, like Letterman or someone like that, and he said. <laughs> That he called it a Quentin Tarantino spelling. So I think he thought he was cooler than shit at the time, which he probably still does. But I noticed that he hasn't done it since. <laughs> I mean, it's no secret that Tarantino has a massive ego. But I guess if he didn't, he wouldn't be, you know, these, we wouldn't have these films. That's right. And yeah, Christoph Waltz, how good was he in it? Yeah, yeah. This is his, the, the role that made him and, and will probably forever be his best. Did he win an Academy Award for this role? Is that right? That supporting maybe he did i had a had a lot of fun watching brad pitt in this one as well that was a, a very entertaining role for him probably the best in snatch yeah maybe even better i couldn't understand him in snatch so you know yeah well that was the point <laughs> oh, yeah. and um go get yeah, the dags get the dags 
Yeah, Melanie Laurent was good as well, uh, playing uh, Shoshana and Eli Roth again. Yep, yep. And then he, he threw a few sitcom and comedy actors in the middle there with PJ Novak and Mike Myers. They were a bit of a surprise. Yeah. Uh, for me, more of a surprise was someone like Michael Fassbender in a smallish role, but meaningful one. To me, he's possibly, you know, one of the best actors sort of of this generation, I think. Yeah, but it was good to see him in there and Diane Kruger and Daniel Brühl and Till Schweiger. So he actually brought a few German actors who have made it big and put them in this. Yeah, um, and Australian, you know, originally Australian Rod Taylor is Winston Churchill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll fight was... them on the beaches, mate. <laughs> August Steele in it, is in it as well. Julie Dreyfus. Um, she was also in um, Kill Bill. But yeah, no. So, again, very, very good cast. And uh, 153 minutes, but didn't feel like it. No, not at all. I, I, was, I was entertained all the way through this. It was, yeah, no. It was, it was a strange film to see for the first time. You kind of need to kind of stomach it later and kind of go, well, hang on a second. What did he do there in the end? Because um, it, it it almost the whole way kind of leads to, uh, you know, seems historically correct or at least a made-up story within a historically correct time frame. And then it just goes off the rails, but you can't help but cheer for it. So, yeah, that was, yeah, it was, it was very well done. And that, that opening scene as well, it's very much an homage to a lot of West Ends. Yeah. Uh, a very, very good start. It's Well, one of his best starts, I think. Absolutely. And it, and Christoph Waltz carries it beautifully. And it's it's acted like a Western as well. Yeah. No, no, very good. Yeah, I rated it as my fifth favourite. Probably reminiscing, I might have pushed it up a little bit higher. But, yeah, very good film. Yeah. Again, for me, for different reasons, I, I find it very difficult to split that one and Jackie Brown because they, they're both excellent films. And, and they're kind of have like for, for slightly different reasons so it's tough to to place one above the other but you know since i felt i had to i i did but they're a lot more even for me well i'm up to my number two so you're probably not your number three was yeah once upon a time in hollywood yeah 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 my number three is kill bill which is you know was your nine i think exactly yep yep again very good film very good cast yeah to me it's the second coolest Tarantino film. I, but again, I do like uh, martial arts films. And this one had martial arts influences. I don't quite see it as a martial arts film all up, but, but it has a couple of uh, martial arts legends in it, which is interesting. And uh, Gordon Liu and Sonny Chiba, you know, people who I've seen in, in martial arts films before. But yeah, Uma, Uma was fantastic in it. Just a cool assassin character with, with a conscience. You know, which was interesting to watch. It was always relatable, but yeah, but a stone cold killer. I, I thought actually, I thought all the, you know, the female assassins in it were were fantastic. Um, Lucy Liu was awesome. Vivica Fox, that's a fantastic scene, and Daryl Hannah, I think, almost stole the show. Yeah, look, they were all, you know, um, Daryl Hannah was much better in this than perhaps in Splash, and Lucy Liu was better in this than Charlie's Angels. You know, like it's very good performances. Yeah, and, and this film maybe more than any other Tarantino film kind of showed to me anyway, uh, how Tarantino can make memorable scenes. And, and it's just like something about his vision is, you know, he, he kind of really sticks with it, but he comes up with, with some fantastic ideas that just stick in your mind. And a good example is, is the Daryl Hannah introduction scene when she comes in and, you know, dressed as a nurse, eye patch, walking down a corridor and whistling that tune. Yeah, I was watching it and I just thought, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and again, you know, he brought back David Carradine after he's been kind of lost for a while. Uh, Michael Madsen is in it, Julie Dreyfus, Michael Parks again. Uh, Michael Bowen, who actually appears in a couple or at least a few of Tarantino's films. Was Samuel L. Jackson in that one or just in the second part? I'm trying to remember if he appeared in that final scene of the first one that kind of ties into the second. But if he was minimally... Yeah. yeah, very minimally. And again, you know, uh, James Parks, of course. Yeah, also the soundtrack is fantastic. And the introduction of the five, six, seven, eights, which is the all girl sort of, uh, I think, Japanese rock group that they play live um, in the film and, and not. But yeah, there's a whole, there's a bit of a story that uh, Tarantino apparently just went into a store and, 
and this CD was playing in the background and he just had to go and ask who the hell that was. And once he got it, he got them to be in the movie. He does definitely have that going for him. He knows how to pick a soundtrack. All of his soundtracks are cool. And it just like it's another character in the movie. So yeah, now this one for me is uh, just, it was just so much fun. And all the references in it, you know, even the Uma Thurman's, uh, you know, Bruce Lee suit and that whole scene, how she basically takes out the crazy 88. (laughs) You know, it's just a massive exaggeration, but kind of like Bruce Lee movies. Yeah, definitely an homage. And as Tarantino always says that, you know, he steals from a lot of other people and and calls it homage. Uh, (laughs) Well, he, he did work at that video shop for quite a while, so he did a lot of homework on different films, didn't he? He he did, and I think that all the bits that he stole from all kinds of films, he put it together and made it something his own. He he created some kind of a, a new language, and um, yeah, and he did it so well. Very, very cool. I You know, after having sort of gone through the seven, eight films that we have so far, we have the same top two. Yes, yes. And for me, my um, second favourite was Reservoir Dogs. Same here. So we also have the same number one. Excellent, excellent. And, well, that was his first film. Very, very short by Quarantino standards, 99 minutes. Mm-hmm. Very original. I'm sure that somebody else had done it, and he's done it himself many, many times since, but it was a breath of fresh air, wasn't it? It was very much out of left field. It just kind of kind of like a punch to the gut out of nowhere, this film. I had no idea who Tarantino was, and I was like, okay, it's got Harvey Keitel in it, you know, and Tim Roth and Michael Madsen. Yep. And Lawrence Tierney and Chris Penn and Steve Buscemi. (laughs) I know. Well, in hindsight, you look at these names now, and it's almost an all-star cast, isn't it? I'm not sure that they were at the time, but now, you know. It very much, very much was, Uh, at least for someone like me who has seen them in a lot of other films and... Some of these people, again, you know, he kind of brought back after they were gone for a long time, mm. uh, especially Chris Penn. And, yeah, just just uh, uh, that question kept sort of buzzing in my head. It's like, why are all these people in this movie? You know, even Eddie Bunker, uh, you know, film veterans. And Chris Penn, was he, he was uh, footloose, was he, when he was much thinner? He was in footloose, yes. Yeah. And Lawrence Tierney, uh, Elaine's father, always remembered as Elaine's yeah. father. Yeah. And Chris, Chris Penn, of course, is Sean Penn's brother. Yeah, yeah. Or was, I should say. Yeah, even the radio voice of uh, Stephen Wright, the K Billy DJ, had had something going for it. But also for me, watching the film, I recognized Stephen Wright's voice straight away. And I'm like, why are all these people in this film? Who is this Quentin Tarantino? I know. Like, how did he get them all? It's just unbelievable, yes. isn't it? Yes. And um, yeah, and then I watched it and I was like, okay, I know exactly how. They already knew who this guy was and what he can do, or at least somebody, you know, had faith in him. And I think that was Harvey Keitel who made it happen, but I only knew that after. And a total budget of $1.2 million. Mm. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's that's probably as much as they paid Lawrence Tierney to be on Seinfeld. (laughs) Probably, probably. Very memorable role, though, yeah. Elaine's dad or or in this? (laughs) Well, I think more Elaine's dad. Everybody in this was good, but Elaine's dad, where Jerry had the coat and he had to put it inside out to save the suede and all that sort of stuff. Very, yeah, no, it, very good. Master of the house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not going out with you in that, uh, yeah. What was it, like a pink, white uh, stripe? It was uh, in the inside. It was pink. Yep. So he made him have it on the outside and it ruined the suede. So, of course, Kramer got the jacket. But anyway, getting back to <laughs> Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> I don't know. Seinfeld's a little bit, you know, funnier. Yeah. But um, actually, the the scene, the beginning with with the tip, with the waitress, with the whole conversation of uh, you know all these criminals around the table, that was very entertaining. And yeah, again, it kind of showed, maybe for the first time, I guess, for us, that Tarantino could really, really write dialogue. Yeah, and it really popularized that slow walk, didn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Done so I mean, many times since then. So many times. That, and then there's also the singing and dancing to Stuck in the Middle with You while cutting somebody's ear off. Very memorable scene. Very memorable. And again, um, this is by far Michael Madsen's best role. Yep. I don't think he ever came close in anything. Which is a shame because, you know, that's 28 years ago. 
And as we're saying before, he's been in almost every one of Tarantino's films. And he's, you know, he's serviceable in all of them, but very good in this one. Yeah, he's a very, very charismatic person. I don't even know if he's an actor necessarily because he never really got more of a chance to do it. But yeah, he was, he was fantastic in this. It'll forever, I think, be his highlight. But yeah, Harvey Keitel, uh, a younger-ish Harvey Keitel, was, was very good in this. Very good. Uh, and so was Tim Roth. Tim Roth was very, yeah, he was great. He was, for me, probably the best character. Well, you know, he was the, the hero, but yeah. Or, or yeah. the villain, depending on how you look at it. He was one that turned against them. You know, sometimes yeah. good guys aren't the bad, you know, sometimes the good guys are the bad guys. Mm, well, he was Mr. Orange. You can't go wrong with that colour. So, yeah. True, that's true. Um, yeah, and Steve Buscemi was very entertaining in this, so, you know, for, forever the uh, sort of character actor, always memorable. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Really good. Yeah. So, well, that leaves us with the number one film, and it's number one on everything for you, for me, for the uh, IMDb rating, for the return on investment, everything. Yeah. A great film, uh, Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Now, for me, one of probably the top three films of all time. That's high. That's very high. It, it, it is high, but I think it's just such a, again, he. it's like he, he, invented a language in this one he the, the dialogue I, I was watching it and i just like f- for a certain time i just didn't know didn't know what i was watching i was like why how is this this good i was glued to the screen i was it was one of those moments where i just sort of it hit me that you can make a film this way with sort of cutting back and forth and you know the non-linear um structure and he did it so well and every scene in this is memorable that's right. And by doing it that way, it made it a such a better film too. Like other filmmakers have done this and you just think, why have they done that? They've done it because the story was so weak, but that wasn't the case here. Well, somebody once said to me, why didn't they just shoot it chronologically? And I said, well, because it would have been not as good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it keeps the suspense because you're trying to work out what's going on, you know? Yeah. And in, in certain parts, it kind of kills the suspense, but it, it helps Especially with Travolta's character being killed off and then coming back because it's non-linear, it helps you see him off at the end of the movie rather than him dying at the end. And I thought that was like a stroke of brilliance. That's right. And again, very good performances. Travolta was very good. Bruce Willis, for me, was probably the best thing he's been in. Well, and and Samuel L. Jackson, definitely one of his best as well. Even Uma was yeah fantastic in, in her role. And she almost had like two different roles in this one. Sure. There's like a before and after. Sure. You know, the event. And again, Tim Roth in a, in a, in a one scene really was awesome, as was Amanda Plummer, you know, yep. Pumpkin and Honey. Also, Ving Rhaim. Yes, he was very, very good. And Eric Stoltz, crank call, crank call. <laughs> Eric Stoltz was fantastic. He, he, he also had a similar thing to the Mia Wallace character was as like, him before the event and him after the event, but he was almost the same, and it still worked. Rosanna Arquette, in in a lot, I have to say though, in a lot of ways, Ving Rhames really put his stamp on this film. He, he, I've seen him before, but I didn't really know him. And from this film, I was like, yeah, this is one cool cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I loved Harvey Keitel as the wolf. He was, yeah, yeah, yeah so absolutely. good. And again, a, a smallish part compared to some other ones, but yeah. There's just even Tarantino was good in it, which is unusual. He's eh. his character was was as annoying as it should have been, you know, as it was written, and he's kind of taking a piss out of himself, and it worked. It worked. Some great lines, and yeah, Phil Lamar and Frank Wally and Christopher Paul Walken. Calderon. Christopher Walken. Talk about again. So many actors in this had a scene that is just uh, in any other film, it would have stolen the whole show. In this one, it's another amazing, another scene. great one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Christopher Walken, oh, Jesus, he was fantastic. And as you love to mention, Steve Buscemi is Buddy Holly. Yes, yeah. You just gotta wonder whose idea that was, but it, it works, you know. <laughs> it works, it works. But even there were a few characters that were not familiar actors necessarily. Like we may have seen them and gone, "I know this guy." He's done something in something, and you know, but you don't, you can't quite place them, but you know, you know their face, like uh, Maynard and Zed. Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. 
Yeah, that was uh, Dwayne Whitaker and Peter Green. And they've both been in a lot of films. But I remember watching this, I was like, I know them. I don't know where I know them from. And again, they were, you know, great in that scene. So yeah, yeah, just Tarantino proved, I think, he, yeah, how, how good of a, of a director he really is. Yeah, and it's almost a shame that, you know, the second film, 26 years ago, and yes, he's made a lot of good films since, but I almost wonder if, you know, if he spent three, four, five, ten years writing this over time, and it's almost like the first album. He did such a good job with it. Yeah, definitely, you know, maybe the best follow-up film of, of all time, you know, of any director I know, you know, who made a really, really good first film. Yeah. You just wouldn't think it'd be possible to make such a good film as a second film with a budget of $8 million. Mm, absolutely, at the time, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah. a, it was an upgrade on, uh, on the first budget, but still. Whew, seven times as much almost, yeah. wow. And this uh, is really the Weinsteins just giving him a blank check, you know, at, at the time. It was... Uh, yeah, that's right. Look, I don't agree with everything that Harvey Weinstein <laughs> did, but, you know. Yeah. Now, look, n- n- there's no question, Despicable and all the rest of it, but he definitely had a, a, a you know, a nose for good filmmakers. You know, he, w- he was known for always signing, you know, talent, but always keeping Final Cut because he would go and butcher the films himself. Yeah, cut them down to 100 minutes and, you know. And so- yeah. Sometimes that was, uh, that was good. You know, sometimes it works for the betterment of the film, sometimes not so much. But yeah, no, you can't, you can't argue with success, you know, Harvey Weinstein and Bob. They, they had a lot of success. Yeah, if you're a male and in control, fantastic to work with. Yeah, and, and Tarantino worked with his producer, sort of partner, Lawrence Bender in this, but uh, also executive producer is Danny DeVito. Ooh, good old Danny. Yeah, I assume he made a couple of bucks for this film. Probably not as much as he made on um, uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, but... Uh... <laughs> That's right. But also interesting that Danny DeVito and John Travolta went on and made Get Shorty, which I, every now and then, I confuse a little bit and think that that's a Tarantino film because it's got John Travolta as around the same time, but way too funny. Way too funny for Tarantino. It's not, it's not just that. It's also because it is based on a um, Elmo Leonard novel. So it's it's got those sort of similarities to Jackie Brown and the language, you know, that sort of cool dialogue. Some of it, I'm thinking, you know, Tarantino was very influenced by Elmo, Elmo Leonard. And another very good film too, but not a Tarantino film. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, around, around that, that time, that was, yeah, that was, uh, it, it looked like Travolta was just going to go from strength to strength. And he did for a little while and then it was over. <laughs> He's very hit and miss. I think at some stage we might do the best and worst of his and might have actually have to sit down and watch, what is that, Battlefield Earth or whatever that he made for the Scientologists or whatever? Yeah, it's not a good film, but uh, it's it's probably, you know, it, it, it gets more crap than it than it deserves, I think. He's had other films that were just as bad, but, but in the last few years he's made a lot of terrible, terrible films. <laughs> Really bad. He's he's gone all Nicolas Cage kind of, uh, where he basically almost will do any film and decision making is not as good as it used to be as far as uh, choosing roles. Possibly, possibly. you know, it's. uh, I think his last good film was fifteen years ago, at least. I think it was Be Cool, actually, which was the Get Shorty uh, follow up. Yeah, that was probably his last good film, Um, and it's kind of sad. You know, he he made. Some decent films up to that point, you know, a lot of uh, good kind of uh, action-y films around that time, you know, the sort of face-off and stuff like that, which I thought, you know, I thought he was really good in. But he also made Basic and what was it, Ladder 49 was all right. A Love Song for Bobby Long was actually a pretty good film, but a little bit too drama. Well, Swordfish is another one of those. Um, but yeah, no, he's, he's, I've, I've always liked him. So him, him being in... Uh, in Pulp Fiction and getting that sort of comeback role was, was a big one in that film. But yeah, Tarantino, fantastic. I have to say just all, all, all up, 10 films that he's made in the films that he's contributed to, even though we didn't talk about them, if we would have included, especially from Dust Till Dawn, it would be high on my list, as would Natural Born Killers. True Romance, it's not bad. It would probably wouldn't have cracked this list for me. And Four Rooms is just a bit too all over the place, you know, with the different directors. I don't know if I could even... It doesn't have a, a Tarantino feel, you know. Yeah. But yeah, to sort of round it off, my top 10, 
From 10 to 1, Kill Bill 2, Hateful Eight, Death Proof, Django Unchained, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Jackie Brown, Glorious Bastards, Kill Bill, Reservoir Dogs, and number one, Undisputed Pulp Fiction. Yep, yep. And mine, Kill Bill 2, Kill Bill 1, at number eight, Death Proof, number seven, Django Unchained, number six, Hateful Eight, number five was Inglorious Bastards, number four, Jackie Brown, number three, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, number two, Reservoir Dogs, and number one, Pulp Fiction. Yeah, by yeah. I think that Reservoir ways. Dogs yeah. is, is definitely like by far the closest to Pulp Fiction, and it does get, you know, bonus points for being the first. Yeah, for, for me, it's Pulp Fiction it gets the gold medal, and then Reservoir Dogs gets the silver medal, and then all the other ones, it's where you get a little ribbon for, for turning up. <laughs> Participation award. I partly agree with some of that, but not quite, but yeah. Because I, I think Kill Bill is, is um, by far the third best. Yeah, I, I know you do, but you're wrong. <laughs> and after that, I think four, five, six are, are, are very good films. And then there's a slight drop off, you know, with, with sort of from seven down. But yeah, Defin- definitely kind of like a, a, a best and least best, not so much a best and worst. Well, that's our best and worst. We've had a few comments on our socials, Atai. Yeah, um, some people uh, chimed in and gave us uh, their best and worst. Some gave us top 10. I chose a few to read out. Bit of a shout out for a few people. So um, yeah, Todd Ernest Braley, also uh, an indie filmmaker, he sent in his best Tarantino as Reservoir Dogs. His worst is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and he even added a runner-up for worst, which is Hateful Eight. We also had Matt Staley or Staley. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. So in case I butchered his name, I apologize. Matt S. Yeah. Uh, Matt is also uh, um, an indie um, cinematographer, filmmaker. He has given us his top three. He actually said that there is no worst when it comes to Tarantino, which we agree on. His number three, well, he said his worst is Hateful Eight, and everything else in between is great but hard for him to place in order between the top three and his last one. So his third is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Second, Death Proof. And his number one and best Tarantino film is Jackie Brown. So that's a bit different to our um, take. Yeah. Where's Pop Fiction? (laughs) Come on, Matty S. (laughs) Yeah, you know, there's no counting for taste. Hmm. But yeah, no, Jackie Brown's still pretty cool. I don't mind that. And the last I have here is um, Jared Johnson. Jared. My good friend, Jared. Jared is a horror writer, and he is also an FX artist. And Jared has given us his full top 10. Ooh. At number 10, The Hateful Eight. That seems to be almost consensus. (laughs) At number nine, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. At number eight, Inglorious Bastards. At number seven, Django Unchained. At number six, Kill Bill Volume 2. Overrated. Uh, At number five, Death Proof. Number four, Jackie Brown. Number three, Kill Bill Volume 1. At number two, Reservoir Dogs. And at number one, Pulp Fiction. So exactly the same top three. As mine. Yeah, and so, yeah. yeah, top two, same as mine. So well done, Jared. You are correct. <laughs> he is correct. So, yeah, yeah, that, that's just a few um, people who have commented on on our socials. And if you'd like to yeah. give us yours for following episodes, you know where to find us. Just let us know what your thoughts are. We will be promoting the themes or subjects, topics for the next episodes in the coming days. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, that's right. That'd be fantastic if you could yeah leave some comments and let us know what you think. Thanks for staying with us for all this time. We've been talking for a long time. Mm -hmm. Thanks for time. And we'll talk to you again another time. Next episode. Thanks for listening to the Best and Worst podcast. We'd like to thank everyone who joined and listened to the show. We appreciate you all and hope you'll keep coming back for following episodes. A big thank you goes out to Tam Hinges for helping us out tremendously and voicing our intro, and Scott Martin for working his magic on the intro sound edit. Also, a big thank you goes out to Asaf Angel for all the help with the logo design. Great work, everyone. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. If you like the show, then please recommend the podcast to your family and friends and subscribe, share, follow, leave a comment. You know the drill. For more information, please check out the show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again next week.